Adam, if you would, give us a take since May 14th, the world changed of sports betting according to the United States Supreme Court. You've been in the trenches working on it. Sort of general overview, big picture, where are we with this new landscape of sports betting? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me today. Really a pleasure. It's funny you say that Darren and I were talking before we went on, and he asked me how long I've been practicing, and I said about eight or nine years all in the gaming space. And he said, when you started, did you think sports betting would become legal? And I said, I didn't think it in 2010 or 11. Frankly, I didn't think it in 2016 or 2017. The first I thought it was even possible was when the Supreme Court granted cert. The Supreme Court generally doesn't care about sports, about gambling. The federal government, for the most part, stays out of the gambling space. So when we found out the case was trying to move towards the Supreme Court, we thought they're never going to hear it. Maybe there is a nuanced constitutional argument they want to hear, but we were all wrong. The Supreme Court granted cert um, early 2018, and then I think, well, I think once they granted cert, everyone thought maybe we have a chance here, and that's when we started to get a lot of interest. And the coolest part, being a gaming lawyer in this space, was that now we're hearing from media companies, telecom companies, apparel companies, companies who have sports assets, and they want to combine those with, with the gambling space. And that's why this panel, I think, is so timely today. Since the Supreme Court's decision came out, keep in mind, PASPA did not make sports betting illegal. It simply said states are not allowed to authorize it. So since May, states have now had the freedom to legalize, adopt legislation, and then promulgate regulations to allow sports betting to occur within their borders, either in person or over the internet. Right now, you have about 10 states that have legalized sports betting, most of which are live. Um, Pennsylvania right now, you can bet in a casino, online's coming. You probably have another 20 states that are considering legislation. Um, Politics get in the way, as always, and the process, I think, as we saw in the last panel, can be slow and uh, arduous. But I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see sports betting legalized in probably somewhere between 25 and 40 states. Just on the straight gaming revenue side, you're talking about an industry that's 3 to $10 billion a year. And then when you talk about the ancillary benefits to sports teams, to apparel companies, to media companies, two, three times that. So this is major business. I think, uh, I think it's very timely to speak about it. And Michelle, major business means major revenues. There are going to be major revenues bringing in the NBA. NBA has been the progressive leader on this with Adam Silver's op-ed in the New York Times four right. years ago, and here we are. Right. When you look at all this revenue coming in from gaming and Mark Cuban saying franchise values are going to double, as the player's representative, what do you see? Well, yeah. I'm not as giddy as everybody else is about uh, about about gambling. I'm not. It's not because of any you know philosophical or religious belief that I, that I harbor. Um, I'm as happy. I am giddy with respect to the amount of revenue that's predict, uh, predicted to be generated, and with the the assistance of my my counsel here during our last round of CBA negotiations, we made sure to include. Uh, gambling revenue as part of the dollars that would be shared with the players. So, you know, part of me is is, is cool with it, um, but I don't ignore what are the inevitable consequences of, of sports betting. And we can look outside the United States and see what's happened in other sports in other countries. Uh, there are going to be winners, and they're going to be losers, and they're going to be big losers. And those losers are going to be pointing fingers. Um, and they'll be pointing fingers at a number of people, a number of, of categories of people, but they, that category will include players. Um, careers can be ruined, brands can be damaged, um, and part of what we need to do is prepare a system that will protect the athletes, and that's, that's who right. I work for, a system that will protect the athletes um, and not spend as much time, or at least spend, as, spend some time uh, protecting against what we know are going to be some incredibly negative potential consequences for our players. So, you know, on a Tuesday, I think about the money, and I'm doing somersaults in my office. And on Thursday, I start thinking about accusations of, of cheating, um, and I become depressed. But I'm working through it, you know. <laughs> I can help you if you want. It brings up so many issues. And Darren, you've spoken on all of them now, covering this full time. You're a living example of the change in what's happened, moving over from ESPN to the Action Network. I don't know where to start. You can sort of bounce off what Michelle just said in terms of where this is going in your mind. 
I mean, there's a million questions. And one of the reasons why I moved to the Action Network is I believed that I could cover the business of betting that segment every day. Um, in 2015, I think I wrote 20 stories on sports gambling. And then 2016 was maybe 35. And then 2017 was maybe 50. And 2018 was 65. And I'm probably going to, in 2019, I'll now write 200. Um, and so, so there are a lot of issues and there's a lot of things to cover. Um, I don't know where to start either. Do you want to, should we, should we ask a specific, I mean, I'll talk for the next hour. So what, what do we want to hit on exactly? Why, why did you make the move from ESPN okay. to a sports gambling website? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, for me, I just felt living in New Jersey I think each each state is basically its own country now, and living in New Jersey and seeing the manifestation of what it, it had become, um, which is basically outside of Vegas, it's essentially Europe, um, where you the difference between New York, where there currently isn't gambling, and New Jersey, is insane. You go from New York outside through the Lincoln Tunnel, and and then on the outside of Lincoln Tunnel, there's the first five signs you see are DraftKings, FanDuel, Caesars, William Hill. There's 13 different apps you can bet from your phone. New Jersey Transit on the buses and on the, uh, the rail, um, they have advertising on the wall, on the ceiling, on the floor. People are leaving in New York. They're leaving their lunch breaks and making Secaucus a tourist destination. Um, stopping, stopping, stopping on the platform, making a bet, and then going back. Um, so I just don't know how many businesses you've ever had in the history of the world where you're able to see a, such a small piece of it in mature stage and knowing that the rest is going to come and also knowing that there's a timetable that's going to give you time because of all the political aspects of it. So I was salivating at this opportunity because I, I, I was living in and seeing everything that was going on in conversations with my friends and society. And so to me, I felt like I had to make the move as long as it was a move to a company that was based in data, that was not taking bets, um, so there was a couple caveats there, and that's how I wound up at action. We'll come back to that. Jeff, you've obviously been on this from the league and team side. I just mentioned with Michelle the, the revenues that will be flowing in from this, and we'll talk about her concerns more, but you've seen that, and you've been part of that from, from the infancy. Uh, I have a bit, and, and you know, look, I, I think, in my opinion anyway, getting this issue out from the shadows is a good thing. It's a good thing for the industry, for the sports industry, frankly, for our society. It's like, you know, the you know, illegal book bookmakers or, you know, obviously I don't bet a lot, but so I don't even know the terminology that's proper. But the fact is, you know, people who, who have placed illegal bets for years are now being pushed to the background. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, and what's evolved is uh, an opportunity for professional sports, teams, leagues, ultimately trickle-down benefit to players to derive new revenue flows that just weren't part of the landscape in the past. And so in that regard, you know, look, I've actually debated this issue with, um, with several folks, uh, in fact, some who have surprised me, uh, in their opposition to sports betting or legalized sports betting, the fact is is that I see it as just another way of of, uh, of teams and leagues, and as I said, ultimately players are benefiting from you know what was taking place otherwise in the shadows. So I think it's all a good thing, and I think that there's an enormous challenge uh, that lies ahead for proper regulating for proper controls, uh, making sure that abuses don't take place to the best that we can. But I think that generally speaking, that this is a really exciting time for professional sports, for the industry as a whole, and the challenge is to, uh, to moderate it properly. 
Darren, some of the concerns that uh, I keep saying I'll get back to Michelle on, but you've talked about, you know, three seconds left in a game with X spread and a, and a re meaningless layup. So what happens there? I mean, you have an issue. Are they going to point fingers at players? Is this going to create a whole new set of problems that we haven't anticipated? Right. So to alleviate some of Michelle's anxiety, hopefully, I think that, yes, it will make the pie bigger, but the legal pie will just take some of the illegal pie. So I would suggest to you that some of this stuff is already happening and the players already have the pressure. Um, but no, I mean, there is an interesting scenario where, you know, by virtue of the NBA doing a deal with MGM, um, which would be, you know, the percentage would be shared with the players, uh, then I say, okay, and the league also saying when you go to MGM, we are saying by virtue of our sponsorship that this is a blue chip brand. This is different from Bovada or any illegal company. So you should go to an MGM sports book. Well, what happens if I go to an MGM sports book? And uh, as Andrew was saying, there's, you know, 10 seconds left and uh, the Knicks are a one point favorite and uh, they're down and, and um, uh, I, I have the Bucks and um, Giannis goaltends at the last second and the Knicks win by one point. And I went to an MGM sports book and I'm really upset that I lost. And then in the effort of integrity, Adam Silver, the NBA, put out their two minute report or whatever. And they put this out obviously before betting, but the idea was to be upfront and there's no conspirators here. And they come out and they say, well, actually that was the wrong call. Giannis didn't goaltend. Okay, so I now went to MGM. That was the book you told me to go to because that was affirmed by you through the sponsorship. I lost. You then told me the next day that I shouldn't have lost, but that I did lose and the game, the result of the game is not changing. But I also, MGM bought the data and the data, like does that stat change? Because if that stat changes, do I have a case? And so these are some of the complex issues that go on. There's going to be another issue with latency. And are, 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 are the games going to be attended? Are tickets going to go up in price? Because bettors feel they have a one-second advantage on live in play. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. But, I mean, certainly the, the conflict between the integrity of the game uh, and the integrity of the result when you try to make the integrity of the game uh, an issue. I mean, there's, there is definitely some conflict. Yeah, I mean, that's, so that's one example. And currently in our sport, uh, the media has access to our players during practices, before games, and after games. And a reasonable question to ask LeBron is, you know, LeBron, how are you feeling? You feel okay? <laughs> And a reasonable response would be fine. Well, last year we learned after the finals that LeBron had a broken hand. No one knew about that. And the first thought I had was, were we in a betting landscape and that information had been revealed only after that, that sweep? I think they were swept, weren't they? Yeah. I can't remember. Um, I, cannot, I can only imagine the outrage that that information was not, was not disclosed to the betting public. So we have to have a conversation about exactly what players are obligated to say um, in response to media inquiries, what teams have to disclose about whether a player is going to be able to play, uh, whether a player is going to be rested. There's a lot of talk now about load management. I mean, we really have to think about the public's right to know um, the athlete's right to privacy and a team's uh, desire to maintain some competitive advantage. And these conversations just aren't happening because um, we're also excited about the money. I'm, look, I'm not, not excited about the money. I mean, one of my responsibilities is to keep my, get my players as rich as possible. So I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing that. It's just that I, you know, as we have time, as these states begin to one by one, and they will very quickly pass legislation. We have to spend this time preparing for the protection of the integrity of the game but and the privacy you, of the players. And I'll get the legal opinion from Adam. Can you protect that data? Can you protect what 
what these players load management, hydration, heart rate, if it, and how do you protect that, and is there a value to that? To me, these are all questions going forward. Data is the key to everything going forward. And now we're not only gonna get data about shot, you know, all the analytics data on the court, but we're gonna find out more about players' variable heart rates and Fitbit and, you know, whatever the next evolution of that is. Can you protect that? I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> you know, again, uh, Jeffrey's here. One of the things we negotiated on our last CBA was whether or not players could be compelled to wear uh, devices that would right. measure some of this stuff. And every, no one said the word gambling, but we all knew what we were talking about. That's, the answer that's, was no, right? The they answer could is not no, be um, but it will un undoubtedly be revisited because when, with the advent of gambling, that is data that gamblers will be interested in having. Absolutely. And yeah. so the question is whether or not we agree to allow that allow players to wear those things have that data be available for sale because that's what we're talking about or not um, and again this is just a, a long list uh, on the long list of things we have to talk about and implications we have to consider what are your players I'll let, and I'll leave you alone in a second what are your players let me tweet what you just said <laughs> Darren's two million followers yeah we can tweet what are your? <laughs> I'm serious. What are your players telling you about legalized sports betting? What What is their reaction? Oh, I won't. I won't quote anyone, but I will say that it's it's it's, it's essentially what I've been saying. We, we, on the one hand, appreciate the revenue op opportunities, but we do want to understand the implications in terms of maintaining the integrity of the sport. We share that goal with the league, and player individual player protection. Um, against false accusations and privacy. So, you know, we're, we're, we internally are having a discussion and we can't wait to have the opportunity to engage in these conversations with the league. Awesome. Jeff, you've been on both yeah. sides, players and teams. Yeah, look, uh, I think that the data uh, gathering is, uh, is, is a really, really key theme going forward. Um, and, you know, just as it's been an element of, of bargaining in the past, I mean, I think it continues to be a a real commercial point for uh, companies that are trying to gain an edge in providing cutting edge material, whether it be Action Network or others. Uh, but um, for example, the, uh, the Alliance of American Football, which just uh, met an untimely end, uh, uh, was a league that, uh, that I'd followed closely. And, and interestingly, it was a bit of a test tube for uh, for exactly what Michelle just mentioned, and that is players wearing wearables uh, that measured their locations, their GPS location on the field, wherever they were. And you, know, you say, why is that a big deal with a startup football league? Well, remember, it was a single-owned entity, so that as opposed to individual teams, uh, with all due respect, there was no players' union, there were no multiple owners, there was a single entity which ran the organization and owned it and controlled it. So they were able to create a bit of a test tube for players wearing these wearables and, you know, frankly, figuring out a way to, uh, to better measure those geolocations of the players for purposes of ultimately feeding that into the sports betting community. Why is that relevant so that you know, imagine the idea of, you know, betting on an in-game bet, for example, in the NFL, where, you know, you're looking at your phone, you're thinking about betting, but you're 12 seconds delayed. If you have GPS devices on players that feed back, you know, again, uh, you know, Darren talked about latency, again, to that point, the, the quicker that data can get to the user, and the quicker that user can make a decision, theoretically, about how to place a bet, theoretically, on the next play, the more useful that data is. So that as you, as you imagine that kind of rippling through from a value perspective, the, you know, the chain of sports betting, players, teams, you know, broadcasters, et cetera, uh, I think that that becomes a really, really key thing going forward. I expect there be there to be a lot more focus on exactly those issues, whether it be in collective bargaining or simply in 
you know, the commercial exploitation of this new aspect of the sports industry. Can I talk about data for a second? Yeah. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Action Network, it's basically three sports data companies rolled into one. Um, and, you know, we allow you to enter your bet and you can watch the scoreboard and see your ability to cash in the moment. And if you have multiple bets, you can kind of watch your wallet. Um, so, but one of the things that we do aside from that algorithm is we have 25 years of data um, and there is a high-end product that we sell called Bet Labs, which is essentially come up with your own theory, uh, betting theory, and then see if it works. And if it works more than 55% of the time, you might as well try it out. So, you know, one of the things you can type in, and this is just, I'm just talking about just the obsession with data and the, imagine if you have even more data, like the health data. But you know, you could you could basically have a theory that if the wind's blowing more than 25 miles per hour, that there's fewer points scored. So that, and Vegas doesn't figure that out, and so the under hits more more when the wind's blowing more than 25 miles per hour. You you type that in, it tells you what percentage of the time the under has hit when the wind's blowing 25 miles per hour over the past 25 years, in whatever sector you want, like college football or NFL. And then if it comes out to a good percentage, then you can click and it will tell you what games this week the wind is blowing more than 25 miles per hour. So, you know, at least gamblers, bettors, most of them don't want to go with their gut. So the more information that you can provide, the better. And what sports has that is different from you know, I, I hate when people say, well, you know, sports gambling, that's a, that's a crapshoot. Well, it's a whole lot less of a crapshoot than investing anything in Wall Street, and I'll tell you why. You know, any company on, on the stock exchange is required to report information four times a year. That's it. I know a whole lot more information about anything that I'm betting versus uh, Wall Street. And here's the second point that I think many people miss. And I worked at CNBC for six years, so I know it well. When you're betting on a stock, even if the stock wins, it's not clear that you win. So, or the company wins, it's not clear that the stock wins, which means it's not clear that you win. So this is what I mean. You invest in a company and the company uh, reports earnings and the earnings go crazy. Well, then the media says, well, we didn't, we expected it to go crazy. It didn't go crazy enough didn't beat its whisper number. And then all of a sudden you didn't win even though you won. But in sports, when I bet on something, the result is clear. I, I, he either scored more points, the team either scored more points, the team won, they lost, they covered, they didn't. And so when you think of that in that sense, betting on sports is a million times more of a, a, a real property and a, and a better bet than, say, Wall Street. Adam, you covered the FanDuel DraftKings explosion in 2015. Is it your theory that that sort of paved the way, provided a soft landing for the country, obviously the Supreme Court, to accept more a more general sports betting landscape? Absolutely. I think from a business standpoint, it made America sports fans comfortable to some degree with the concept of gambling, even though I'll argue to the death that fantasy is not gambling. Um, I think there's great, we can argue about that all day, another panel. Good luck with that. <laughs> but I think it made the leagues, the teams, and everyone involved much more comfortable with the concept that this is coming and that people can engage in sports in a new way, find new um, entrants, find new viewers, participants, find new ways for viewers to view sports. And I think that paved the way for, for where we are today. From a legal standpoint, I think the companies in the industry right now have learned a ton from the fantasy experience. Whether you think fantasy was gambling or not, it was clearly on a very, um, very uneasy ground in, you know, in 2014, 2015. That did not stop um, FanDuel, DraftKings from going on an all-out ad blitz. And you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing five, six, seven commercials in a row for these companies, especially during Sunday football. 
the companies who are looking at the space right now are taking a much more measured approach. And I think you see that particularly from the non-gaming companies who want to get involved, whether they're media companies, merchandising companies, any companies with sports assets or broadcasting assets. They say, we want to be involved in this, but we want to do it in a way that's, that maintains integrity of the games and that maintains our brand. And, and, I, and I think Michelle hit on those points. So I think in some ways, maybe it's fortuitous that the legislative process is taking so long because it's giving some of these non-gambling companies, as we'll call them, an opportunity to sit on the sidelines, really be poignant and make make the right decisions in the long run. So, so I think the fact that it's going to develop over the next five to 10 years, I think you're going to see a much more mature market and you won't see that, that crash that happened with fantasy and it won't be as sporadic. There's also a really unique dynamic here uh, in that, you know, the U.S. is kind of following Europe, and it's usually the other way around, it seems. Um, but, you know, in this particular area, the U.S. has been, you know, more conservative than our, you know, European brethren, and, uh, and, and has frankly been more conservative in terms of rolling out any kind of, you know, acceptance of this as being a legal means of you know, fun, plain money, however you want to describe it. Um, but with that, you know, there's a whole generation of companies that are rolling over from Europe that are experienced in the sports betting world. Now, one of them happens to be a company that I have a bit of familiarity with called Sport Radar, which is now, I believe, the official, uh, uh, you know, data provider of all the major leagues in the U.S., so that, you know, imagine that, you know, we grew up, at least many of us grew up in, in an era where, you know, Elias House, El, Elias House, Elias Sports Bureau, House Sports Bureau, you know, AP, you know, those are the data aggregators of our day, right? That's, those are the box scores that you read. That's who compiled them. And today you have companies like Sport Radar, which is a Switzerland-based company and is essentially the back end of the sports betting world in Europe. So that they're kind of the, they're the, the, the quiet back end of, of that world for anyone who wants to get involved, place a bet, whether it's through William Hill or whoever else, it's like Sport Radar, you, you can bet, well no pun intended, is probably the provider on the back end of that business. And now we're seeing Sport Radar and many others coming from Europe, um, you know, the UK in particular, where there's an extensive, uh, you know, business in this regard, and it's and it's it's influencing how it rolls out in the U.S. I think it's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to me following sports law through the ages, and the first commissioner coming into sports was due to the Black Sox scandal, 20, uh, 1920, and the Pete Rose still banned from baseball and the Tim Donahue scandal. And it was always this, you know, integrity. You can't get near gambling. And I'm still, I'm asking this in so many ways. What changed? Like, what is this? Why is it so accepted now? Are we just being, being bullied by Europe? I mean, what has changed about this issue so much? And is it simply revenues? I think some of it has to do with the parallel course of marijuana and cannabis. Um, I, I think that, I don't know why, but it seems like that has always had a predominantly positive connotation, um, while gambling has had a negative connotation. And I think just the states and the articles reviewing cannabis and marijuana and the legalization of that coming along at the same time as, as this uh, is one of the reasons. And I think the other reason is we're just talking about it more. So it's making more sense to people, um, except that athletic director on 60 Minutes. Sorry, I have to take another <laughs> shot at him. The, the idea that, that uh, it's not happening and now it's gonna happen is just not true. Right. And, and, and the idea that you can see uh, ir irregularities um, and that it would be, it'd be harder to cheat is completely true. Um, you even ha you you look at tennis, which is you know one of the most absurdly bet sports. You know I have people in my office who are betting 
more on a tennis match than the guy who, if he won, would win. And that's normal, actually. Like, they're betting not like challengers, which is like one under the ATP, but they're betting futures, where if the guy wins a tournament, he wins 1700 bucks. And who's offering that bet? Oh, Betfair. Oh, everyone in Europe offers that bet, yeah. Um, and so, you know, you just have to figure, okay, like, why has tennis noticed all these scandals? And they've noticed because it's happening, the irregularities happen, and it's spotted. Um, and I think it's, you know, in some sports it's easier to pull off cheating um, than not. But I think just under the microscope, if you believe that sports is a concert of individuals together, um, it, it, it makes it harder to do, and it makes it harder even when we have the data now and the love for the data to pull off something like Donahue, which as the NBA said in their long letter after the ESPN article, and I, it'd be interesting if you guys read both, even the facts of the Donahue case are, are disputed as to how much was done and known and forced and whatever. So I think a lot of people are talking about it now. It's more out there. I think we're having more rational conversations because when I moved from ESPN to the Action Network, I expected some of the negative stigma stuff, and I really didn't get it. Hmm. And I, th I mean, I did not get the negative stigma stuff, not that I didn't get it. Um, and so for me, that was like, okay, something in the last six months has happened. We've had these dialogues, and maybe it's the legalization, the Supreme Court hearing it, but I, I, I think it's making more sense to people now. And yes, there are the, there are the negative sides, the, the downsides of anything that lead to addiction. Or, but it's not doesn't start with the negative now. No, it is amazing. And when I covered the the move from the Oakland to Las Vegas, the Raiders, the owners' meetings, I'm like, what are your concerns about Las Vegas? Well, it's a small market. Is it going to last? Is it sustainable? Gambling until like I'm like, what about gambling? Oh, we're fine. We're fine. Really? And a, and, and, and a year before, they stopped Tony Romo's fantasy convention, yeah, right. Right. you know, because they were in a establishment that was connected to a casino, you yeah, know? I, I was once told that the answer to every question is money, and um, nine times out of ten, that's, that turned out to be true. I, I, when I, I'm, not as, I'm not as young as I look. When I was a kid, <laughs> I remember people in my neighborhood playing the numbers, right? Yeah. I mean, and now every, almost every state has a lottery, and it makes a ton of money for, for and fills state coffers. Well, that's what gambling is. And so I think our tolerance level increased when, when people took a, a closer look at the amount of revenue that could be generated, and frankly used in, in great ways for, for, for individual states. Um, so yeah, I do think we've matured. You know, sort of some of the religious objections that people traditionally had; those things have pretty much fallen by the wayside. But even the, even the Bible Belt, which you would think <laughs> that's right, which you would think would be traditionally slow in even having conversations about gambling. I mean, there's many states that have adopted bills. It's the it's the tribes that mm -hmm. have stopped it. So it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Yeah. Even that yeah. is yeah. relaxed. But it's it's but for the money, um, I don't think it would have accelerated the way it has. But there's a lot of money out there, and it should come from underground. There's no question about that. It should come from underground. But let, let there be no mistake about it. We're not just becoming <clears throat> much more sophisticated in our thinking. We're counting the money. And, but, the, and to ahead. that point, this has been a process. I mean, I remember, it, you know. 2006, 2007, I was running the Arizona Diamondbacks, and we took a proposal that we had from a Native American uh, casino that wanted to sponsor our team. And it was for a multi-million dollar per year deal. For Wasn't it like years. a presented by season type of thing? It was, it was thing. Gila River Casino. And it Come was, on. And, and guess what, it was the first deal in that space that Major League Baseball allowed. And we had to go all the way to Bud Selig to get approval for it because, you know, the initial reaction was, oh my gosh, you know, we can't allow you to... And they did not have sports gambling. That was just gaming. That's right. That's right. And they, and they said, you know, well, we can't have you associated. That's a bad thing. It'll be bad precedent. So that's where this has come from. And today, I mean, there are, you know, I, I don't even want to you know, guess at the number, I'm 
assuming it's uh, you know a hundred or more sponsorships around sports with yeah. Native American casinos, um, whether it's Suns or Diamondbacks in Arizona, or frankly any number of teams around the U.S. I mean, it's now a natural and a and an accepted practice to do. It's it's a category that you want to make sure you fill. Uh, when you're selling sponsorships for a professional team. So again, it's come a long ways. What was the Padres, Cy Schwan or something like yeah, that? Yeah, that was it. And we had Oneida Nation Casino in Green Bay. Same thing, Indian. But, you know, the, the thing, Darren and Michelle and Adam, you can weigh in, what is going on with the leagues? They've accepted the Supreme Court ruled, obviously, but they didn't want this. They fought it for seven years in court. They spent a lot of money. Yeah, millions. And, the, and the, fl the flip is just hilarious. I mean... They want federal. I mean, I mean, Adam Silver is okay, but everyone else, I mean, when the Las Vegas, when the Vegas Knights came to town, I was there um, the, for the first day when they announced the team, and Gary Bettman really did say that he, would, he did not want the two casinos, sports books closest to the arena to, to have the Knights on the board. Like, that's a, 18 months, that's a crazy flip to a press conference in New York to announce not, we're selling non-exclusive relationships as many, come one, come all. You know, I mean, it's, and, and the NFL is very interesting because at the owner's meetings, they've quietly basically schemed out how they're going to turn on this. You know, like, right now we're going to do a casino relationship, but not a sportsbook relationship. And then soon, we'll do a sportsbook relationship, but, but publicly, they, they haven't said that. Right. So it's, it, it, the flip is crazy, and I think Michelle's right with the money, but you just, I guess you just fall on your sword, because it's embarrassing if you go back and read the clips. Well, does a federal statute, which is what the leagues want... In your opinion, Adam, do they have any chance? I mean, I know our president is a former casino owner, but does that have any chance? He doesn't pass laws. <laughs> right. Uh, from everything we're seeing, I think a federal statute is, is highly unlikely. I think you, looking at the history of gambling in this country, the federal government has generally kept to the side. Um, when they have dabbled their foot in it passed by the Wire Act, they haven't done so particularly clearly, and they've often created more questions than answers. And then I think you just have the landscape in politics right now. There's other issues out there that are clearly more important, I think, um, as a country for the, as a whole. There are a few, yeah. There, there certainly are a few. Um, Congress can't move on those, so to think they're going to move on something like sports betting I think is highly unlikely. And day by day, the more states that regulate, the more states that pass legislation, I think the harder it becomes to find a unifying federal statute that, that answers it. Now, having said all that, um, the Department of Justice came out in January, um, took a very drastic interpretation of a federal statute called the Wire Act, which might have great implications on the future of internet gambling, which would affect internet sports wagering. Um, potentially drastically, it could, depending on the interpretation, the level of prosecution the DOJ brings, could, could really harm that industry. If that were to happen, I think you're gonna have a very strong gambling lobby, a very strong lobby from states that have gambling that depend on tax revenue. That could lead you towards a federal resolution, but short of that, I, I don't think the federal legislation um, is particularly likely to pass. Any of these leagues have a chance with these integrity fee asks? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no, no I, 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 I'm, la I'm only laughing because not yet. Um, I mean, part of I, I must say I agree with the league's desire that there be a, a, a federal framework because you know we're chasing different states trying to have some impact on what different states are doing. We too, with no luck, by the way. You know, they're not, we're not getting a piece of the action either. Right. But I, no, I. I, I, I Unless the tide turns right now, it looks like they're going to continue to strike strike out. Do you disagree with that, Darren? Have you well, right now they have, they've had, there's not a single state of the eight states, there's not a single state that has, has it. The leagues are trying to get them to write it into a bill, and that's how they do it. Originally, it was said that the integrity fee would be 1%, so 1% off the top of the gross handle, and now they're saying it, it would be about 0.25%. Well, let's just take a bit what's going on here in Pennsylvania. 
Pennsylvania was said to be, in a way, New Jersey was the impetus for the suit and Chris Christie, but Pennsylvania is gonna be the state that's gonna emerge as the winner. And right now, Pennsylvania has one-tenth the monthly revenue in sports gambling as New Jersey. Part of it is you don't have mobile yet, and 80% of the uh, money that New Jersey is bringing in is mobile. But part of it is also the fact that the state has decided to charge $10 million for a gambling license and then taking another 41%. So you'd think, oh, 0.25%, that's not a lot. But when you take into account the fact that as of now, under the current scenario, an operator in Pennsylvania, if they're saying there's no other brand Halo and they're just looking at what they're bringing in, a lot of people don't think they can make money under that system. So whether it's point two, anything greater than 0% is, is an issue. So I don't think it's going to happen. I think the leagues have been lucky enough to be able to sell their data because that's a big debate too. Um, I'm sure some of you, you know, you guys know the Stats versus Motorola Inc. case where it basically said that stats when tied to names are not subject to copyright. Uh, and so like the leagues, and this is a whole big thing with fantasy too, you know, can the, do the leagues sell the relationships and the logos? They can't necessarily sell the stats, but they've been pretty effective thanks to MGM. And I know a lot of operators are mad at MGM for doing the deals with the leagues for affirming that this does have value when there are third party stats providers that cost much less. And the leaks say, oh, you get the marks on your app and you get a whole bunch of other things. But even the one, the, the, the most preeminent one in, in Europe that's come over to the U.S., William Hill, has so far refused to do a deal with the league, not believing that, uh, that there's incremental value. So I would say right now they're lucky to get data. Data is going to be a huge business if it gets affirmed and they're going to be making a lot of money. One last thing is that... The money does come from media. Um, you know, I think when the NBA got their last bump, I said, well, this is it, as everyone has said after every deal. Uh, this is it. There can't be another increase here. And then gambling comes along, and you have now, you know, the guys that are the best at this type of stuff are finally the Apples, Hulus, Netflix, Amazon, those guys are the one clicks, the micro pays. They are the best for, and we'll have it by 2022, 2023, in game betting on a single screen where you can just click. So I feel like it's impossible that we won't have another uptick in rights fees because we're finally bringing along the technological partners that are the best at this. Um, so if they don't get their integrity fee, they'll make money in many other ways. Absolutely. I, I, mean, I agree. The platforms may change, but, uh, but, the, but media is going to continue to drive uh, the rights uh, around sports. And, and ultimately, look, the control of that, of that IP is what's valuable. And that's, you know, the players play a part in that. The, the owners of clubs who take risks and the business plays, obviously play a part in it as well as do the leagues that oversee them. But the fact is, is the control of that IP is going to continue to drive, uh, you know, rights fees and the like. And I agree completely, Darren. I mean, I think the, the, the incremental uh, uh, part of the industry that's being created right now and shaking out in front of our eyes around sports betting is going to just enhance that. Um, the, the, the last thing I'd say is that as it relates to kind of how that happens and how it rolls out and what the effect on, on franchises is. Um, and, you know, Andrew, you referenced Mark Cuban's uh, comment about how, you know, my franchise just doubled in value. Look, uh, probably a little ambitious on his part, at least uh, on the front end, but, you know, maybe not long term. Um, I know that I saw an NBA, uh, a prospectus on an NBA team recently um, that I'm under NDA on, but um, in that... But can I tweet that you saw a prospectus on oh, an yeah. NBA team? No, you can't. Okay. But, I, figured uh, the, I figured the NDA part would, would <laughs> not be good. A lot of media. NDA there. is more important than NBA in that <laughs> regard. But, uh, but in any case, in that 
in that prospectus, it suggested that, uh, and this was you know six months ago, right after the Supreme Court ruling, it suggested that there was going to be a projected incremental 10 to 15 million dollars a year of revenue that was going to come from sports betting. Now I guarantee you that the investment banker that put that together or the team of or the team official or owner who inspired the you know the 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 theory, you know, they didn't know. They're just guessing. It's kind of, you know, it's it's literally throwing a dart against the wall at this point, but Ultimately, when all this shakes out, as we've all suggested in our own way up here, there's going to be extensive value that's going to flow to this industry. And everyone is going to get their rightful piece of it. The data piece, the ownership piece, the player piece, even the lawyers. Well, <laughs> let's the hope, lawyers right? get a lot. <laughs> anyway. Always the lawyers. Comment. Last question on what you were just, there will be lawyers. You can tweet that. Um, the, uh, Michelle, speaking of lawyers, the last question is collective bargaining. You mentioned with Commissioner Silver, you already have dealt with that in the existing CBA. I guess the obvious question, I know the answer, but is does this move up the priority list for the next CBA with attorney Jeff Kessler here? Does this move up as a real bargaining, not only to address revenue, but to the other issues you have? Well, you know, we, 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 we got it, so right. we now know that that's going to be part of uh, basketball-related income, but the, the issues regarding data, I mean, those are things that right. were left unresolved, and there's no, no, no secret we're going to have to talk about those things because the implications are now significant. So, sure, it's, it's, it's certainly no longer number 30 on the list. It's probably number two or three. Um, but I got my, I got my, uh, my gladiator, so I'll be fine. <laughs> See, I'll he's, work, say, he's working on it now. He's working right now. Jeff, that's he's you. Writing a memo. And then let me. And just a kudos, you know, there are a lot of inharmonious labor relations between leaders of unions and leagues. It just seems like you and Commissioner Silver have a very strong working relationship, which is really a model for pro sports. So congratulations on that. Maybe it appears more harmonious than it is. Who knows? <laughs> Adam, Michelle, Darren, Jeff, thanks. This has been a great time. Thank panel. you. Thank you.